Great. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you uh, to the University of Toronto Women in Medicine uh, student group for inviting Dr. Jane Healy and myself to have a conversation about financial issues that matter to women. I'm Dr. Steph, and I'm an assistant prof at U of T Med, where I teach financial literacy, and I'm also on Instagram and YouTube at Breaking Bad Debt. Today, I'm joined by my co-lecturer uh, for the financial literacy curriculum, Dr. Jane Healy, who is a pediatrician at Trillium Health Partners. Jane and her husband, Dr. Paul Healy, cre created the Physicians Financial Independence online community, which has over 30,000 members and is a space where physicians can teach each other about personal finance and happiness that doesn't accept any advertising and is free from industry bias. So both of us do not have any conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, just as uh, you know, as just some brief information, if there are any questions, please post them in the Q&A. And at the end, uh, we will turn off the recording and answers your questions uh, candidly. So I just wanted to start by answering the question, uh, why should women care about their finances? Firstly, uh, women face unique challenges in building their net worth. In 2019, Forbes magazine published an article about the career choice myth, where the myth is that there is a gender pay gap because women choose lower paying jobs than men. But in actuality, the article argues that work traditionally done by women is undervalued by society. Even in medicine, which is considered a higher paying job, there is still uh, gender wage gaps within specialties. Our specialties, for instance, uh, pediatrics and family medicine, being two of the lower paying ones, do tend to be predominantly women. Amongst racialized women, the minority tax also hinders uh, women's chances of promotion and higher pay. Um, women also need to have the knowledge to be financially independent because domestic violence happens to one in five women and 99% of domestic violence cases consists of financial abuse. It can often be difficult to uh, leave the relationship when you don't have access to your bank account, credit cards, or even have a good enough credit score to rent a place on your own. And in a study by Statistics Canada, um, women rate themselves as less confident when managing their finances. Um, and maybe it is the lack of confidence, or maybe it's being preoccupied with duties at home or at work, such that in a study of mixed sex households, 90% of husbands were designated as being the more knowledgeable partner in the relationship amongst uh, top 1% net worth couples. So why should women care about this statistic? Because when women don't have a baseline knowledge of household finances, it makes it easier for them to be taken advantage of by financial salespeople. It can worsen burnout and overwhelm and also prevent women from having the financial independence they deserve. And in fact, a lot of women uh, do outlive men statistically. And so when your husband no longer is there who are managing the, hus uh, managing the finances, it's really, it can be a really big burden for women to try to figure everything out uh, on their own while also dealing with a death in the family, for instance. So I just wanted to kind of set the scene and I'll let Jane, uh, Dr. Jane Healy bring up her presentation so that women can gain the confidence we need to succeed financially. All right, thank you so much uh, for having me tonight. So I'll run through some slides as well and then look forward to the discussion that we can have at the end. Is, can you see my slides okay? All right, excellent. So um, uh, as, uh, as Steph mentioned, um, I, I'll, I'll just keep it formal. I won't call her Dr. Zara, I'll call, I'll call her Steph and I'm Jane and we're all friends here. So um, I, I absolutely agree that it's important for us to talk about navigating finances, especially as women. And the statistics that Steph mentioned are sobering, aren't they? And, you know, oftentimes I think that there's um, um, for, for people in a relationship, it's it's easy for one person to say, oh, you take care of the finances, I'm not interested or I'm intimidated by it. And traditionally that has been women who have let men manage the finances, but that definitely does put us at risk. So it is something that we both advocate strongly for, that it is something that you should try to be interested in or at least involved in so that you are aware of what's going on. 
again, there's no disclosures. My financial credentials are really this Facebook group that, that Steph mentioned that I run with my husband, Paul. And really, we're mid-career physicians. You know, we're in our later 40s now. And we don't have a, you know, financial advisory certificate or any kind of credential. But we've been around for some time. And we've had an interest in personal finance. And it's sort of been through the school of hard knocks and have learned a thing or two. And and really, this group was born out of our desire to share what we learned with our colleagues, because we often don't get this education in school. That's changing now with the financial curriculum that Steph mentioned that we're part, proud to be part of. But still, there isn't really enough talk about financial topics. And we've done even, you know, we've posed for a silly picture in the Globe and Mail in the financial section. Um, which um, which was really a way to reach some of our older colleagues that aren't on social media, and that certainly worked. Um, and we're very fortunate to be invited to talks like this, to talks all over Canada, really, to speak to our physician colleagues and students and residents. And um, at the bottom is a screenshot from a, a wonderful conference that, that Stephanie organizes um, and has run for three years in a row now, and she manages to get excellent guest speakers. Um, and again, it's just to keep that conversation going among Canadian physicians to learn these financial literacy skills. Um, and this is the financial curriculum that, that, that was already mentioned. So whenever we talk about money and finances and relationships, I always like to sort of uh, set the ground rules for the talk. And that is, is that, it, you know, some of these things are very personal and um, it's important that you just take what's useful to you, what, what resonates with you and leave the rest. Don't consider them a judgment. Don't consider them something that, you know, everything that, you, that is discussed has to apply to your life because it won't. We're all individuals, but perhaps you can take, you know, some of the things that we talk about tonight and, and see yourself in kind of going in that direction or really having it resonate with you. So, very quickly, what is financial independence? That's something that we generally as physicians strive for eventually to reach because we often aren't in a situation where we have a guaranteed pension for when we retire. So we're essentially responsible for our own retirement savings. And so reaching financial independence means that you no longer have to work to fund your lifestyle. And it means you've invested and saved wisely so that you can just live on the interest or the dividends of what you have saved. And some people kind of think, well, isn't that really retirement? And it's not because, because financial independence is truly independence. It's a, it's a state of autonomy where you can decide whether you want to keep working, maybe cut back, maybe pursue other interests that you weren't able to pursue uh, while during your working career. So really, it, it really is about autonomy. And burnout is a big part of it because we've all heard about burnout. It's all over the news. It's um, no surprise to anyone that COVID worsened it, made it much, much more significant. Um, the last CMA survey on the physician burnout prevalence in Canada, it's very sobering. So um, six in 10, physicians responded that their mental health worsens now than before the pandemic and lots of other statistics that I won't all go through in detail because it basically says that you know things are not great in the medical profession. Doctors are tired, they're burnt out um, and but many of us have to keep working because it brings in income we have to save for retirement. So this is where that autonomy piece becomes important. Burnout has lots of different causes, but um, one of them is the managerial aspect of, of burnout, where you know having poor working conditions in hospitals or in your in your office, if you're in the community, is a contributor. But so is this lack of financial education and the lack of financial literacy that generally exists among doctors, because you're tasked with managing a business essentially after you graduate and finish your residency. You know, many physicians incorporate, that gets complicated and overwhelming for physicians. Many become business managers and running their own private clinics, which comes with all kinds of other responsibilities that, you know, no one really teaches you much about. 
So um, as I mentioned already, it's this autonomy piece that um, financial literacy and reaching financial independence gives you, and it gives you this autonomy over your time. And that is one of the things that can potentially help with reducing or preventing burnout. Because eh, you know, if you don't like what you're doing, if you're tired of what you're doing, if you're financially secure, you can cut back or you can quit. You can pursue the things that you find rewarding. And um, instead of being out there and you know working hard to, to earn the money, right? And it's it's really the reason I have the evening free tonight to speak to you um, because it's something I enjoy doing instead of being on call yet another night, right? And being up all night. So uh, Steph already mentioned this. You know, financial literacy is super important. Uh, there's health outcomes and, and household finances that are linked. Uh, financial difficulties are common triggers of stress and anxiety and many of the other issues that uh, Steph mentioned. And it, the financial industry is unfortunately not, often not fiduciary. You know, you would think that when you're contacted by financial advisors or banks or insurance advisors that they really have your best interests at heart, but you really have to be careful because we are a group of professionals high income earning professionals and so are unfortunately easy targets for maybe not so ethical people in the financial industry who are not fiduciary you know if if i am treating a patient i'm going to do and decide on the treatment that is best for the patient right in my world you know if i admit a baby to the nicu and put an iv in and you know, st start treating them with antibiotics, I get paid more for that than going to assess the baby, leaving the baby skin to skin with mom coming back, you know, it, and I can't, I'm not going to make a clinical decision that's going to pay me more if it's not to the benefit of my patient, right? That we have this fiduciary responsibility to our patients and we take it very seriously, but don't assume that the financial industry is the same. It is not. What are some extra challenges we face as women? Well, having children impacts a physician's earning potential, and let's face it, women are, uh, are generally the, those having children. There's the financial confidence piece. Uh, women uh, traditionally have been less confident in managing the household finances. There's that statistic that Steph mentioned that, you know, in the top 1% of income earners, the husband is designated as the as the one that's more knowledgeable in finances. And there's, of course, the gender pay gap. And there's a study um, that was done by the OMA fairly recently exactly on that. And so I'd encourage you to sort of read and understand more about the gender pay gap, because I think it's going to become more and more of an issue. It's finally being recognized and hopefully addressed. And I love this cartoon, and I think it just sort of speaks to what we deal with in medicine, right? Um, women traditionally have those roles at home of managing the household tasks, and uh, and you know that puts us at a disadvantage. And you know that's not to say that you have to divide every single household task 50-50, right? But there has to be some leeway, right? Ideally, you want in a partner someone who won't dump all of that household task stuff onto you as a woman. You want a, a partner that contributes to other aspects of running the household. They don't have to be the same, but they have to be a contributor so it doesn't all fall on you. So I'll just share a bit of my journey. Um, you know, I'm an immigrant from the former communist Czechoslovakia. So this is me sitting in front of. Uh, a downtown Toronto hotel where we were placed uh, by the Canadian government as um, permanent residents after spending six months in Austria as political refugees. So my parents were educated, they were physicians, but that wasn't recognized in Canada. So we essentially arrived with four pieces of luggage and uh, that was about it. No one spoke English and off we went. So certainly my family had challenging beginnings and I have immigrant blood course, coursing through my veins for sure. And that is one of the things that makes, you know, saving money, being frugal naturally easy because this is how I grew up out of necessity. 
Um, I got married between medical school and uh, starting pediatric residency, which was all the way back in 2001. So I've been married almost 20, what is it, 22 years. And, um, and then I had my first, we had our first baby in my third year pediatrics residency. And at that point, I took a six month maternity leave. And we had a bit of a childcare crisis because my mom, who was supposed to look after my daughter after I went back to residency, became unwell. And so there was a big childhood or childcare scramble, but somehow we got through it. And then um, I became staff. So I became a staff physician. And initially, I was hospital based and had a community practice. But then, you know, life just happened and life was busy. My husband was an emergency physician working shifts. Life was very busy. And so, um, and then we got hit with this surprise where trying to grow our family had unexplained secondary and infertility in my early 30s. So, um, had all kinds of treatments, unsuccessful IVF. And, you know, that was a really, really difficult time. And, but luckily, even though IVF didn't work, then there is a boom surprise, and uh, and now we have our our second child, who's now fourteen. The older big sister is almost twenty; she's in second year university. So time has definitely flown, um, and I'm I feel very grateful that I have my little family. Um, with my second one as staff, I took an eight month uh, maternity leave, and soon after, I closed my community practice because it was just too much. Two kids, both shift workers, um, I something had to give and I enjoyed my hospital work more. And so that's what I decided to keep. So what are some of the financial lessons learned? I mentioned that, you know, Paul and I have kind of been through the school of hard knocks. And what are some of the, you know, the, the key learnings we, we kind of taken over over the years? So First is that your savings rate is your key to growing your wealth because you can't become financially independent if you don't save and you can't save if you spend most of what you earn. And so our general rule and our general advice is really to be mindful of spending money on what brings you value and what brings you happiness. And that's different for everyone, right? What makes me happy is different what makes you happy, but really consciously think about, you know, is spending money on this something that's going to improve my life, make me happier? Because, I mean, there are people out there who are in the habit of spending more mindlessly, and um, that can really detract you from your goals. Failure to control debt is a big problem. Um, you know, we, we often meet with, you know, physicians or residents and and uh, there was one particular colleague of mine who sat at our kitchen table and said, you know, my debt seems so big that I can't really pay it off soon. And I've just accepted that I'm going to have it for a long time. And I feel like it's part of me. And I think that that's, that's something that was definitely even more of an issue when we had this fairly recent um, uh, number of years at record low interest rates. People were really not interested in their debt. They kind of figured, well, you know, interest rate is low. I'm not really, not not really interested in paying it. And uh, things have changed a bit. We'll talk a bit more about how the how the interest rates have changed, and that really has shifted people's mindsets. Um, um, luckily, I think for, for that's a good thing because people are thinking more about their debt because if you're carrying a big line of credit, it's now accumulating big, big interest uh, amounts each, each month. So there's the compound interest beast, right? So we've all done lots of math and understand the principle of compound interest. And um, really the idea here is, is that, you know, the longer you carry debt, it'll compound against you. So it's really, important to, to know that um, any unnecessary spending that you do while you're in debt compounds against you and grows, right? So what, what is $100 today is going to be $500 in the future that you'll have to pay down. So again, make that judgment call whenever you spend money. Is this something that's really you know worthwhile for me and has good value? This is that prime rate I mentioned, you know, th this is 
just since uh, last uh, last year, over the last year, we've had stepwise increase up and up and up. So the prime rate is now at 6.7%. And if you look at over the last 10 years, you know, we've had we had this unprecedented period of very, very low interest rates. And then boom, you know, in 2022, we've had this stepwise increase and there's really, you know, no end in sight at the moment. So, um, so debt is definitely more on the minds of, of um, students and residents and, and early career staff. And it is something that, that um, does need to be addressed. Make sure that if you have a line of credit that the interest on your debt is at prime minus 0.25%. I think most students and physicians have that now, but do make sure that whatever the prime rate is that you're paying less uh, minus 0.25% um, of that. Um, and once you become staff eventually, don't let the bank move you off of that rate, negotiate with them. This was something early in our group five years ago that was sort of more rare, but now it's, it's pretty commonplace and the banks kind of know that if they're not gonna leave you at this rate, you're going to go to another institution as you should. Lifestyle inflation is a is a potentially you know a big issue because because it's very tempting after you finish all this training all this hard work that you've done um, to maybe go for more house or you know the the pricey fashion items and you know of course there's the the uh, envy of the doctor's parking lot the Tesla although they're very commonplace now. They're not even that rare. <laughs> um, but I pull up in my 12-year-old car, which still runs, and you know it gets me to work just fine. So um, it, again, this is not any type of a judgment call. This is just something to be aware of that it's very easy for lifestyle creep to happen early in your career because suddenly you know you have all this money coming in. There's the debt, but the debt's been there for a while, so it's kind of easy to ignore. Um, and you know, it's tempting to buy all of the things. And many times, some of your, you know, peers who were who went into finance or engineering have been working for many years already because you took so long to train that it's it's very tempting to try and kind of catch up. But be aware that that comes with with downsides. So. Living like a resident after you become staff for a while until you de get your debt under control will really set you up really well for a secure financial future. And living below your means um, is, you know, it's something that we live by. Um, you know, we live in a very nice home in Oakville. That's partly because we, you know, graduated and bought a house at a time that the real estate prices weren't as crazy as they are now, but we certainly, you know, could live in more. We don't want to because we don't want to have to work more to pay for more house because the house we have is perfectly adequate and meets our needs. And also um, it sets an achievable lifestyle for children as adults, right? Because there's actually some interesting evidence that shows that if kids live in very wealthy neighborhoods, um, that actually there's some risk of, you know, anxiety and some issues for them as adolescents and young adults. And, you know, the thinking is, is that perhaps it's because there's a lot of pressure for them to, you know, excel and kind of uh, meet the same type of lifestyle that they're, that they're accustomed to in these very wealthy neighborhoods. So living below your means is actually shown to benefit your, you know, your children. Um, and it also gives you an opportunity to teach financial life skills, right? So we still price match at the grocery store. We shop sales. We involved our kids always in those decisions. When we make a big purchase, we talk to them about it so that they're, they understand what the sort of process in, in making good choices and getting the best value out of, out of the money you have. Do we have to price match strawberries at, at the grocery store? to put them on the table? No, but is it, good, is it a good life skill, right? To, to know how to do that and just to effortlessly do it? Sure it is, right? Because who doesn't wanna save money here and there? Because it adds up over time. 
So one of the things that we, we like to talk about is something called the fate rate. And this is um, um, what, we, what we call the fate rate, stands for funds after taxes and expenses. And essentially it's, it's something that you can calculate by taking um, how much you made um, after taxes and all expenses, and you divide it by the number of hours that you worked. Um, it sounds like a pretty easy calculation. It's actually harder than you would think. So once you're working as a as staff, there's lots of things that you're doing that aren't necessarily, you know, face to face um, time with patients because you have to drive to work, you have to get yourself there, you have to do CME, you have to do all your bookkeeping for your finances. There's lots and lots of things that you have to do in terms of your time in order to be a grown up doctor, right? And so all of those hours count. And so a lot of physicians are often surprised by what their fate rate is. And, you know, oftentimes they think, oh, well, I make $200 an hour or $250 an hour. But when you take all those expenses and all the time that you spend, it's actually not as much. And so then what you can do is you can think of expenditures that you may be considering and convert them instead of dollars into your time, because really your time is money. And so thinking of it in those terms can be a useful tool in kind of getting that sense of, is this good value for me, right? So a $300 dinner, four to six hours of work, a you know, $12,000 family vacation, 160 to 245 hours of work, which is you know three to five weeks. You know, and then that Tesla, the top model, is, is a lot of hours, which can be for most physicians, you know, one to two years at work. So again, if the car is important, it's going to make you happy, bring you good, you know, good value, absolutely get it. But that's, that's the price, right? One to two hours uh, or one to two years of you working, right? So, um, so it's, it's a good useful tool uh, in addition to any of the traditional budgeting that you may be doing, you know, setting aside money for vacations or, or large purchases. It's something you can kind of quickly do as a calculation in your head before making a purchase. So um, uh, money and happiness is linked. And I think we've all, you know, there's lots and lots of studies out there that look at um, happiness and income and, and generally, you know, there, there is a limit to, you know, how happy you are at what level of income. I'm not going to go through this in too much detail, but um, our colleague, Mark, Mark Soth, who runs the Looney Doctor blog that I would encourage all of you to read through, has done a lot of great uh, articles and, and, is right, and is in the midst of releasing a basic financial curriculum on his, on his blog. He has a lot of advanced topics, but um, he's kind of gone back to the basics and creates fantastic materials. And one of the things he talks about is sort of, you know, um, money and happiness that, you know, it's it, happiness isn't just about the things you have, but it's the relationships you keep and the learning you do and the ongoing curiosity and the experiences you have. So it's, it's more than just the level of income that, um, contributes to, to your happiness as an individual. So in terms of family planning, this is something that, you know, when I have medical students working with me on the wards, um, they'll often ask about, like, how do you even begin to think about kids? And um, so, it, you know, lessons learned, again, is really choose your partner wisely. And I wish I could put more on the slide um, and, um, you know, give you great tips and tricks about how you can protect yourself. Um, you know, there's prenups and postnups. And honestly, anytime I've heard a, a lawyer speak about all of those things, it just kind of, <laughs> it makes my head spin and makes me wonder whether any of that will actually make a huge difference other than opening up a conversation, which is really, really important. So I think for any couple that is cohabitating or, you know, getting married, um, it's really important to have these conversations about money. How are we going to manage finances? Trying to get an understanding of our, is our philosophy around money and spending similar? Or how are we going to you know, manage all of that? And you know, this isn't a talk about how to have successful relationships, but since we all like evidence as doctors, I really like these 
these few points from the Gottman Institute about predictors of successful relationships. Um, and the reason it's relevant in a financial talk is because as Steph mentioned, there's a very high percentage of relationships that end in divorce and divorce is very expensive and it can be financially devastating, right? Not anything you can't recover from, but it can be a big financial setback to in your journey to financial independence. So the predictors that the Gottman Institute has kind of um, diluted out out of all of their research is that successful relationships have high levels of friendship, respect, affection, and humor, and that there's a ratio of five to one or better of positive to negative interactions, right? And, and, and really what this is about is that it's okay to be annoyed with your spouse because they, you know, don't take the dishes out or don't load the dishwasher or load it really weirdly. Um, but on, you know, on balance, the, you have more positive interactions than negative, right? There's successful bids for attention. So that means that, you know, if you come home and you say, hey, you know, this is what happened at work and, you know, your spouse is actually interested in what you have to say, right? If they don't even look up from their phone, that's, you're not going to feel very good about that. And that can wear on relationships over time. Um, that there's soft starts to disagreements rather than explosive name calling type of uh, situations. Um, interestingly, one of the things they found is that the husband accepts influence from the wife. <laughs> so, um, so um, you know, sometimes men will say happy wife, happy life. I think that's where that comes from. Um, and that partners are aware of and respect the other's needs, likes, dislikes, and their inner life, right? And, you know, again, so I've, we've been married almost 22 years, and I would say that, that this is bang on. This is really, really good guide to successful relationships. So, um, you know, one of the ways to protect yourself is just being aware of the, you know, people you're with, that they're treating you well, that, that this is a healthy relationship, because having it break down can be financially uh, devastating, never mind, you know, um, um, you know, all of the other implications of, of losing a relationship. So how can you protect yourself financially? Like I mentioned, this, the domestic contracts, I think are mainly important for opening up that conversation. Um, be aware of the family finances. I cannot stress how important this is, even if you're not really interested it's important to know what's going on, where the bank accounts are, where the insurance policies are. It's a vital sign of your family. And it's something that really, really is important to keep on top of um, because uh, so many situations where women are either taken advantage of or there's some secret gambling problem or um, you know, someone who's trading options and losing lots of money and you know, the, the, the wife has no idea. It's, it's, it's really important to know what's happening in your, in your financial life um, with a partner. And uh, setting up personal and depending on the province you're in corporate wills. And when is the best time to have a baby? Well, there's no perfect time. Um, what I would say is really, really important is that is a time when you want to be really confident in the commitment to being forever linked to your partner. So, um, you know, getting married, that's very easily reversible, right? Like, yes, there might be a bit of a financial hit. Yes, there's going to be paperwork or whatever. But once you have a child with someone, you are forever linked, right? And so I think that is a time when if you have kind of those spidey senses or those little doubts about, is this the right person? You know, on those things of successful relationships, like are we striking out on all of them? before you have a baby, that is the time to really look at that. Because once you have a child together, you are forever linked to this person. Um, it's an unfortunate fact that reproductive potential decreases as you age. And you know, we our training is long. And, and so that does not work in our favor. So there's lots of different options. And I know colleagues who've gone this route of egg freezing because they're not with a partner that they, you know, want to have a child with. And so they, they you know, want to be, want to be proactive and do some planning. You, some women are single mom by choice. 
Um, and some are child free by choice. No one says that, that you absolutely have to have children. Absolutely not. That is, that is a choice that you make that's best, whatever is best for you. And then planning for parental leave is definitely challenging. You know, it's a period of little to no income um, that, and, and it, can, it can be challenging to kind of piece it all together. And I'll go through this very quickly. Steph has excellent resources on her, um, on her YouTube channel in terms of planning uh, maternal and, and pater parental leave in, in Canada and all of the resources that are available. So I'll just go through, you know, this very, very quickly where, you know, there's employment insurance. This is generally when you're a resident because you're being paid a salary. Um, then, and you would receive a top up at that time. And so um, in medical school, unfortunately, there really isn't a whole lot available because you're not working and paying into EI. And so the only options really are taking a leave of absence, right? And so, so having a baby in medical school can be extra challenging. And um, so, you know, residency, there's EI and a, and a pop up. Um, the advantages are that you don't really have to find coverage for your practice, right? You can just take a maternity leave and the programs are used to that certainly far more than they used to be in the past. Um, but having kids when you can't control your schedule is challenging. And, you know, I certainly found that having a baby in residency, having to go back to one in four in-house call as a pediatric resident, it was really hard. Um, as staff, you're eligible for, uh, for 17 weeks uh, of uh, funding. Um, and, uh, but the disadvantage of staff is that you know, you're, you may need to find coverage for your practice and you may have ongoing overhead costs and guilt of leaving your colleagues um, short staffed, right? So um, there's different challenges as staff for sure. But then again, you then you may have more control over your schedule. So the bottom line is, is that there's never a good time to have a baby. If you feel confident, that your partner is the person you want to have the baby with, I would say go ahead when you feel right. There's advantages and disadvantages to both. And there is that biologic reality that, that if you wait too long, there, there might be challenges down the road. And then finally, I'll just mention a bit about family entanglement. This is something that we see a lot in our group where, where people will talk about, you know, how, you know, the, they have family members that have high expectations of them to get them out of financial trouble when something goes wrong because family often misinterprets your high income as a physician eventually for high net worth they forget that you've studied for a long time you might have a high debt when you first graduate and you're seen as stable capable smart um and so and sometimes um, families feel that your success is attributable attributable to them so you know, we've heard from um, people that their parents have said, well, you are our retirement plan. And that's a lot of pressure, right, on a, on a young staff. Business and family, just be very, very careful, right? Uh, businesses have to make hard decisions. So if there are close relationships involved, um, that, can, that can get tricky. Uh, so, so something to be aware of. And then there's the whole family crisis situation, you know, your brother needs uh, needs help. Can you help him? Your sister needs to move in. Can you help? Um, and generally, what we say is is a good rule of thumb is to think about the end at the beginning. Think about what are some of the goalposts. What are some of the parameters? Like I'm going to help you through for this many months, or you know, if this happens, we're going to handle it that way because. When things kind of happen without much conversation around the ground rules, things can get very messy and hard to kind of extract yourself from. So, um, uh, so, so just as a you know broad idea, think about the end at the beginning. Um, very quickly, because Steph already mentioned about women in investing that we're generally not as as confident. Um, so I'll quote a, a fidelity investment study out of the US that looked at uh, women and um, basically women felt very confident managing kind of this CFO of the household, you know, the chief financial officer of the household, the day to day finances, balancing a checkbook, uh, managing the household budget or making purchases, but 
we're far less confident on things like selecting investments or um, you know, thinking about uh, financial goals and financial planning. Um, but when they actually looked at the statistics, the women who do invest do better than men, all right? So let's, let's say that again, women do better than men. And why is that? Women likely uh, take less risks. You know, some of our male colleagues are, you know, very confident in their, you know, superhuman investing abilities and ability to predict the stock market. But the evidence will tell you that you cannot. No one can predict the stock market. And so women are more likely to buy and hold and not take high risk investments like pot stocks and, you know, um, and uh, cryptocurrency and just buy and hold, which is exactly what the evidence says you should do. And so women overall do better. And it's 0.4%, which we didn't really get into, um, you know, percentages. It sounds like a tiny amount, but 0.4% is actually a huge number. So if you do 0.4% better each year than men, that's, that's a lot of money over an investing career. So that's a very significant amount. Um, and I really like this uh, title of this article, women may be better investors than men, let me man mansplain why. So this is an article that go goes over how overconfidence in men is bad and women are less likely to fall, fall victim to it. So go women, right? So don't, don't feel intimidated when you get to a time when you have money to invest because it doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be complicated. That's the rules we live by. We, we invest very simply and um, you can be very successful at it that way. So some takeaways, financial literacy is important as we've both highlighted, I think tonight, your fate rates, the relationship between money and time, use it to make sure you're spending money on things that bring you good value and happiness. Your savings rate is your key to financial independence. And there's no perfect time to grow your family. And women are better investors than men. So some resources, that's our group. And of course, our, always Steph's resources are excellent. And I already mentioned the Looney Doctor blog, which is also an excellent resource. So happy to answer any questions.